right, good evening, everybody. We are in our second class that we started a couple weeks ago on discipleship. And uh, if you've got the material, that's a good thing. If you don't have it, raise your hand. And uh, we, got a we got somebody that'll uh, give you a copy of the material. Matt Finley wanted me to make sure that everybody knew that his um, material for Sunday morning is printed out back there for uh, Hebrews. Um, so make sure to grab that if you're in the Sunday morning Hebrews class. But it's uh, very good to be with all of you tonight. I hope, uh, I forgot to send out an email, but I had asked you guys in the last class that when we come back together to bring like colored pencils or highlighters, at least have the, te the, the material that's being handed out given to you. And hopefully you've got like a pen or pencil and uh, I'll explain what we're going to be doing with that in just a little bit. But uh, two weeks ago, we started these classes on discipleship. And I want to do a little bit of uh, review of what, what we are doing in these classes and where we're going. Uh, there's another hand over here. And the one right here. Do you have a hand? No, you don't have a hand? Okay. Um, so... Uh, these first three classes, which we're going to combine classes two and three tonight um, because of services from last week or Bible study from last week. But these first three classes are all about foundations for discipleship that will get us ready to then look at uh, lessons four through eight where we're going to look at different things in the life of Jesus, really try to imagine ourselves being around him and observing the way that he interacted with people, observing the way that he reacted to people, uh, and try to learn some things from his example. And then the last five classes are going to be dealing with methods of Bible study, which uh, in a lot of ways is like the centerpiece of discipleship, or uh, that's where discipleship uh, flows from, is when we learn how to study uh, effectively. And we'll be doing some of that sort of thing even in this class tonight, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But can anybody r remind us from last class, what, is, what are some definitions of discipleship? What is the definition of discipleship that we're using in these classes? What do you guys remember from that? Yeah, we're, we're a pupil or a student of somebody. We're followers. So with these two comments that were just made, and remember, if you guys can't get the microphone, that's fine. I'm going to try to repeat the comments. If you want the microphone and you get time to get the microphone, that's great. Um, but if you don't get it and you got like a quick answer to something, just don't be shy to say something. And I'll try to remember to repeat it for people that are online. Um, so between the two comments that we just had, being a disciple involves uh, following and learning which means that there's two components to discipleship. It's not just an academic thing, and it's not just like how you live, because you don't really know how to live until you've learned how to, how to live. And so it's, um, it's a combination of being a student and then following the things that you've learned. So the definition that we're using for these classes is that a disciple is a learner who follows and a follower who learns. And so... Uh, after tonight, these foundational classes, that's why we're going to start talking about following Jesus by looking at some things in his examples in the Gospels. Uh, and then the last classes are going to be about learning how to learn better by looking at um, some methods of Bible study. From the last class, what did we say are some of the purposes of discipleship? What's God's goal for us as his uh, students, as his disciples? Yeah, be fruitful and multiply. Remember at the end of Matthew 28, where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, and he's saying that to his apostles who are also disciples. The idea that they're supposed to reproduce after their own kind. And we've already alluded to, to the first one here, that one of the purposes is that we learn from Jesus. We learn to imitate who he is, the kinds of things that he said, to think and feel the way that he thought and felt. So we're becoming like Jesus, we're reproducing. And in the last class, we talked about all kinds of different passages that show that. If you'll recall, the idea of learning from Jesus, we looked at six passages in the Gospel of Mark where the disciples are asking Jesus questions, just constantly asking him questions. 
And then those are moments where Jesus will teach them something that deepens their understanding. And one of the applications that we made from that is if we never have questions about the Bible, it might be because we're not reading it effectively. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go ask other people your questions. It could be you, you write it down and then you meditate on the question. But if you never have questions about the scripture, it could be an indicator that we're not really trying to be disciples of him. Because uh, the disciples always had questions to give to him. Okay, so um, the goals for all these 13 classes that we're doing, we're trying to cultivate a deeper resolve to follow Jesus Uh, We're trying to be challenged by Jesus' example and then learn how to learn better. So this class tonight, I think, is going to combine all three of these goals uh, as we look at this text in Luke chapter 9. So in the material, it's page number 5. And what we're going to do is look at two texts in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus talks about discipleship and what it means to follow him. Beginning, by the way, in Luke 9, 51, the gospel says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. So beginning in Luke 9, 51, Jesus starts making his way towards Jerusalem, and between chapters 9, from that point on, through chapter 19, there's, there's statements in these chapters like as Jesus was journeying, as he was making his way. And throughout these nine chapters, ten chapters or so, he's making his way to Jerusalem and he's going to have a lot of instructions as he's on his way to the cross on what it would mean to follow him uh, and take up your cross daily. And so uh, as we look at Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62, this is one of the first things, the interactions that he has after he set his face towards Jerusalem. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give everybody uh, maybe three to five minutes of silence. And I want you to have the material with a a pencil or highlighter or or colored pencils, whatever you want. and, And just... Read and reread the text and reread the text and just notice the observations that you see in it. And that's what we're going to use for our discussion. Now, I'll give you one thing that might help with this time as you look at the text silently. But this text has three dialogues that are happening. So I've broken them up up here for you to see that Jesus has three conversations with people. And I want you to try to think about what's the um, connection between these, which one of these people seem the most similar. If you were learning about what it would mean to be a disciple of Jesus, what would this text be showing you about discipleship and what would that mean for our life today? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and and just read this text and then you guys silently mark up the text uh, however you like to do that sort of thing. Just do it however is helpful for you. And then after a few minutes, we'll break, we'll come back and discuss. Did you have something? Yeah. Does anybody else need a Bible Does everybody? Okay, we got two, we need two more. All right, so I'll, I'll go ahead and read the text, and then um, I'll tell you guys when the time is up. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, uh, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. All right, so just spend some time writing down any questions you have about the text, any observations you have, and then we'll just share those things when we come back in about three three to five minutes.
right, let's come back together. And um, what did you guys notice? Yeah, a lot of what he's talking about here deal with priorities. Priorities over what? Right. Yeah. The, like the, I don't. I don't want to give too much away uh, with how the text is structured. But yeah, like there's there's struggles for these people to to. I just don't want to say too much. All right. What 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 else do you guys see here? Paul yeah. mentions following. Yeah. Good. So um, in verse. 57, I will follow you wherever you go. And then Jesus says to one of them, follow me. And then he says to another one in verse 61, follow, uh, I will follow you. You notice um, in the first one, G somebody comes up to Jesus and says, um, I will follow you. What happens in the second two? He's calling other people, right? So that's an interesting thing to notice there. I thought I saw another hand over. Yeah. Yes. That's right. I, I'm sorry, remind me of your name again. Matt. Matt. So Matt just pointed out that when Jesus calls the first four disciples in Mark chapter 1, uh, the two sets of fishermen brothers, they drop their nets and they start following Jesus. The, the second two guys here um, want to go do some other things first. Yeah, and that, these guys are not doing that. Right. Yeah, good, good, good observation. What else did you guys see? We don't know the rest of the story. Yeah, like we don't know what ends up happening with these people. Like we don't know what ended up happening with the rich young ruler ultimately. Like there, we don't know, but Jesus is, yeah, were you going to go on though? Right. If we're Yeah, we don't know for the first one, for sure. Follow? I don't know. Right. Perfect. Yeah, the second two are seem to be a little bit more resistant, but maybe maybe they changed their mind. I don't know. Good. What else do you guys see here? Yeah, Debbie? Right. Like, if you think signing up to follow me, me means that you're going to have a nice, comfortable life, well, I don't have a place to lay my head at night. So I, are you okay if that's what this lifestyle takes you to have to do? Jamie? Right, yeah. Like, the, yeah, good. What else? Yeah. David? Right. Yeah, it's, it, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you something. And this is, like, I noticed at the end of verse 62, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying here that you have to be fit for the kingdom of God. And if you're not fit for it, then you're not part of it. And so uh, it's going to require these kinds of sacrifices. And this text, I think, is helpful to try to provoke that within us. Do I have this kind of resolve like Debbie was saying? What else did you guys notice here? Sure, yeah, I think there'd be multiple layers of, of, of depth to this text, and that would be another one. What else do you guys see here? Yeah, Wes? Yeah, the, 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 this was a culture, especially for the second guy, and, well, the second and the third, like, uh, follow me, but he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Now, what do you think he means by that? Let me go bury my father. Was he dead? And he, he was, what does it mean? 
Yeah, I think, I think the idea would be, like, my father's getting close to death. Like, let me just take care of him. And then once that happens, then I'll follow you. Maybe it means that. What if it literally meant, though, that he was dead and we had to go do the funeral first? I, I don't think that's what it meant. But, like, could the call of Jesus be so important that you'd be willing to not even go to your father's funeral? Maybe that's what it's saying. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but how countercultural would that be in a society where family matters more than anything else? Yeah, Matt? In, in Jewish, uh, that's part of the, the thing. Honor your father and mother. How better gift than honoring your father? Marrying him properly. Right. And look at this call that Jesus has, which even supersedes whatever cultural ways that they've distilled how to, how to obey that command. Yeah, Matt? Yeah. A literally dead person. Right. right. So, you could be referring to spiritual people that are in the Let them go deal with, with the earthly things. You come and preach the kingdom of God. That's right, yeah. And he says for that second guy, part of discipleship, like we've said in the first class, is to reproduce after our own kind. You go preach. That's part of what being a disciple entails. Good. What else do you guys see here? Yeah, Brian? What was the difficulty in verse 61 is that Christ, knowing that he had heart, would have been able to discern if he was making some sort of claim that he's too polite to follow the rabbi. Or if he sincerely meant, I just want to do this one thing. And, and we don't know that with the rest of the text. But it does seem to me that in 62, Jesus just wants to go out of his way and warn people, not necessarily to reject the command of the rabbi, but to warn Yeah, yeah. And, um, well, let me, let me show you this here. So here's, a, I broke this up, at least on this chart. There's a bunch of ways that you can dissect things and think through things. But the first dialogue, you could classify this first guy as like the idealist. Like, I see what, I, I, Jesus, I'm going to be there for you. Like, wherever you go, I'm going to follow you. And notice that Jesus doesn't praise the guy. He doesn't go, well, that's just great. That's awesome. We're going to look at a text, if we have time tonight, in Luke 14, where a giant crowd is following them. And he says, hey, guys, if you want to follow me and you don't hate your family, you can't be my disciple. Can you imagine if, like, on a Sunday morning, we had, like, 300 visitors from the community, and then Mike or I got up to the pulpit and we said, hey, it's, you know, that's cool that you guys are here, but unless you're willing to hate your family, then you can't be part of this. That's sort of like what Jesus is doing, right? But... We would get angry at a preacher today who would say something like that. The call to discipleship is so high and important that we make sure that the priorities are what they ought to be. Um, and so this guy needs to realize that Jesus' lifestyle, like, okay, if you're going to follow me, that's great, but you need to know what you're signing up for. Now, notice the second two people. Both of them are placing perhaps family above following Jesus, um, but did you notice for both of them, they have a statement where it's something like, Lord, let me. Lord, let me. You see it in verse 59. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury the, uh, uh, my father. Verse 61, yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me. What, what's problematic with that? What are they trying to do? They want permission. They they want Rodney. Good, right. 
And, and so in, in doing that, like, those things clearly would have really mattered to those people, right? Like, my father matters to me. Like, let me say bye to my family. That matters to me. Those are good things. Um, but they are trying to negotiate the conditions of discipleship with Jesus. Yeah, like, that'd be great. Let me follow you. But, Jesus, let me first do this. Do we ever do that? I would like to follow, yeah, I'll follow Jesus, but he better not affect this part of my life, or he better not mess with this thing in my life. We are not in the position to negotiate with Jesus. And that's exactly what they're trying to do, uh, the second two. E even if it doesn't seem like a big thing, that, that kind of heart that they're showing there, Jesus says is not the kind that's fit for the kingdom. Um, all right, yeah, Jim? Um, so the reason why Joseph of Arimathea has to be quick to bury Jesus is because it's the day before Passover. I don't know if there's anything outside of like a, um, an upcoming Passover or a Sabbath day that would like cause people to have to quickly bury somebody. I'm not sure on that. I have to look into that. But that, that, that's, that would add another interesting wrinkle to the, this whole thing. Anything else you guys see here? Right. Do you see this intention with something else somewhere? Do you see this text intention with something else? No, no, not at the moment. Okay, all right. I thought I saw another hand over here. Yeah, Bill? Right, and, and you see, like, I think one, one of, yeah, these are all good comments. Does anybody have anything else that they see? I, I guess what I can say is, I can say I'm not married to my parents right now because I got to take care of my father and my mother first, and I'm going to honor God, therefore I'm not going to get married. Right, yeah, it would be like, that, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, well, and there'd be times where, okay, so like, um, Abigail was born on a Sunday afternoon at 4.44 p.m., Right after Abigail was born, I got a text message from one of the guys in, at the church in California saying, hey, are you preaching tonight? And I said, no. Does that mean that, what does that mean for me? You're not leaving your wife. I'm not leaving my wife, so does that mean I'm not following Jesus? Or did Jesus say something about, like, loving your wife and nourishing her and being there for her and stuff like that? So, like, we got to figure out, like, how these things kind of work together but in this moment, the call of, of literally leaving things and following Jesus, this is what Jesus says about this in this instance. And when you start to try to negotiate with God, you're on the wrong side. And so um, now I, there is something else that I want to say about this. Um, go back to 1 Kings 19. In 1 Kings 19, this is, um, in the context, Elijah has just um, battled the prophets at uh, Mount Carmel. And uh, the, the prophets of Baal have been killed, and it seems like everything's going to turn around in the nation. But after, and the rain comes back, and after all of this happens, you might expect that the nation's going to have this great, like, restoration back to God. But instead, Jezebel orders the execution of, of, of Elijah. And so he gets a bout of spiritual depression. I think in chapter 18, it's like this great moment in his life. And then in chapter 19, he like wants to die. He's one of the three people in the Bible that say that they'd rather die than continue living. And so what happens is he goes to Mount Sinai. 
And um, an angel has given him food, and then he, he fasts at Mount Sinai for, um, for 40 days, like Moses did on Mount Sinai. But look at 1 Kings 19, and the reason that we're looking at this text is I asked this in the material. I asked in question number two, compare this text with 1 Kings 19, 15 through 21. What similarities do you see? What differences do you see? Why do you think Jesus is alluding to this passage? So um, let's just skip down in the text and look at 1 Kings 19, verse 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was, uh, and he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what, I have done, uh, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. All right. Does that sound like uh, the story in Luke 9 is sort of echoing what happens in 1 Kings 19? Do you see some parallels between these stories? What similarities and what differences do you see between these two stories? You want to kiss your mother and father goodbye first. Right. So Elisha wants to go say goodbye, kiss his parents, before he starts following Elijah. Does Elijah let him do it? Yeah, he permit that, yeah, that's fine, go ahead and do that. Okay, so that sounds really similar to this interaction Jesus has. By the way, there's a lot of parallels, especially in the Gospel of Luke, between Elijah and Jesus. So what differences do you see? Like, what, why, why do you think Jesus might be doing a callback to this scene with Elijah and Elisha, if that's what he's doing? I think he is. Yeah, in verse 20, go back for what have I done to you. Does anybody have a different translation there? Amanda, what does the HCSB say? Okay. Anybody have another translation? Anybody have, have any ideas of what he means by that? Yeah, and, and like, yeah, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not laying, like, some kind of claim over you in the sense that you can't do something like that. I think it's sort of the idea, but it is a kind of a cryptic statement. But it, I think it's something in that ballpark. So why, what, what's the connection, what are the connections between the Luke 9 story and the 1 Kings 19 story? Elijah lets him go say bye. Jesus says, no, you can't do that. Yes, yes. The call of Jesus is a higher, more significant, more urgent call than even being the guy that's going to be shadowing Elijah, who was just told a couple of verses before this to go anoint Hazel to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat. Uh, he, he's telling him to do these international things. And so Elijah's ministry is really critical but what's more important than even Elijah's ministry or more significant or more urgent to get on board immediately is Jesus. Yeah, Jim? Well, I kind of hated my dad anyways, and Jesus told me to, like that. <laughs> right, good. Right, good. Any, any other things you guys see here with the two stories? All right, let's go to the next lesson then. Um, lesson number three, page six. And this is what we were going to do... Um, Oh, I had this thing. Let's see if there's anything that we missed here. Oh, yeah. 1 Kings 19.20 is really similar to Luke 9.61. Even the wording is pretty similar. I just wanted to point that out. 
So, okay. So let's do the same thing with Luke 14, where Jesus does say to hate your father, your mother, your brother and sister, even your own life. Here's another text in Luke where Jesus talks about discipleship. And um, let me see. Let me, okay, let me just go ahead and put this up here, and then we'll do another couple minutes of silence to look at the text. But in this text, Jesus is going to say there's three kinds of people that he says cannot be my disciple. Number one is whoever doesn't hate your family or your own life, um, whoever doesn't bear the cross, and then in verse 33, whoever doesn't renounce all that they have. All right? Um, So in between the second and the third, you cannot be my disciple in less statements. You've got verses 28 to, uh, that should say 32, actually. Um, What do those verses mean? And then how do verses 34 and 35 fit the context? So there's some questions to help guide you as you're looking at the text. But here, we'll we'll add this to what we did before. If you want to talk to the people next to you um, and discuss it together, and then we'll we'll, uh, kind of break open and and, uh, come back together as a group. So you guys can, like, if you want to read it with the person next to you or think about it by yourself, whatever you want to do, but I'll give you guys a few minutes and we'll do the same thing we did before.
All right, because we don't have a whole lot of time left, I want to break it open into the larger discussion here. What did you guys notice here? Yeah, it's all about like counting the cost, the things that you would have to consider giving up for the Lord. Uh, that seems to be like an overall theme to this whole section. What else do you guys see? Yeah. Okay, good. And, and if you don't have this kind of resolve to follow Jesus, how are you going to live out the goal of discipleship? Very good connection. What else do you guys see? Yeah, like none of these things happen by accident. Right. I did build my chicken coop in Atlanta on a whim, and it turned out okay. But, so, no, yeah. But nobody does a real project without thinking about it. He's not supposed to, right. Now, right, so here's, um, here's a hot take on verses 28 to 32. There's, a, there's, I think, two legitimate ways you could look at 28 to 32. Number one is he's telling the audience, you guys have got to count the cost. You guys have got to figure out, am, am I really fit for the kingdom by being able to do this, right? And I think that's oftentimes the, the typical way we understand that, and I think that could be a totally legitimate way of reading it. The other way that you could read it is that Jesus is giving an explanation on why his standards of discipleship are so high. In other words, he could be saying, I'm the one trying to build something. I'm the one trying to amass an army. And I want to build it with the right stones that are totally committed. And I want to have my army be filled with people that are going to follow me to the death. So if you're wondering why... I, I'm saying you got to love me more than family, or you got to hate your family the way he says it here. Um, you, have, you have to bear the cross. If you're wondering why my standards are so high, because I'm trying to build something, and I'm trying to make an army. Now, that's another way of reading it. I'm not saying that is the way of reading it, but those are two different ways to look at the text. I think either way, both things would be true, but which one of those things the text is indicating could be both, I'm not sure. But that, I'm just throwing that out there as, as one of the options. What does it mean to hate your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters? Samantha, I hate you. What does that mean? Love less. Love less. Yeah, love less. One of the jokes that Samantha and I have with each other is we'll say we hate, I hate you. As, as, like, as, a, as a romantic way of what Jesus means here. That, like, I love, I, and it means a lot to her when I say that and when she says that to me. Because it really means that I love God more than you. And that's like how, how we get it, right? So I hate all of you, by the way, too. That wasn't as funny, I guess. Uh, what, what does it mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and this goes back to what Gerald was saying. Like, there's other passages that we know we're supposed to love our wives, and we know we're supposed to honor our parents. He can't say, like, you actually work to destroy these people. It's saying the comparison, that, that the love you have for God is so, so, so much higher than the love you have for anybody else that it would feel like hate towards that person. Debbie? Right. 
That's a really good point. Like, in keeping with the war imagery in the text, like, these are gonna be parts of your life that are attacked. Like, what if, what if somebody has a sword up to your wife's head and says, are you gonna renounce Christ or not? Right. Yeah, so that, that's a good, I never thought about the war imagery and how that would even apply to the way they're gonna be attacked. That's good. De David? Yeah. Right. Right. And the way that Jesus, like, it, what if Jesus just said, hey, guys, if you want to follow me, you've got to love me more than your family. Would that have been, like, as jarring and caused you to meditate and go, like, whoa, what, what was he saying? I think he's trying to get them to think deeply about this. Yeah, Jim? Yeah, which the Greek word is to agonize. Right. And, and however you want to read verses 28 to 32, it would make sense what I said earlier, but you have to count the cost too. Yeah. Oh, Go for it. Yep. Yep, that's good. Good. That's Very, I yeah, go for it. I just want you to keep in mind that Jesus is not asking us to do anything he didn't do. That's right. Everything he's asked us to do, he modeled first for us. Very good. Yep. Thanks for the good discussion, guys. Appreciate it.